All right, welcome everybody to this afternoon's session. Our first talk is a 30-minute talk, and it's by Jeff Elmore. Jeff works for Metametrics, which measures the complexity of text-to-match readers to uh, appropriate reading materials. So uh, Jeff is going to talk to us today on measuring and modeling the complexity of children's books. So let's give him a warm welcome. All right, uh, thank you guys. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna tell you about a project that I've done with my company uh, analyzing some children's books. Uh, so here's the kind of basic plan of the talk, give some very brief uh, background, and then I'll tell you about uh, the studies that we did, and then I'm gonna jump into some IPython notebooks uh, to, for two purposes. One, to show uh, the IPython notebook for people who haven't, haven't seen it yet, and I'm really excited about it, and uh, also to show you uh, some of my analyses. So a little bit of background. Uh, my company, Metametrics, its main product is this, the Lexile framework for reading, which allows for differentiated instruction in reading by placing readers and text on the same scale, the Lexile scale. Uh, and this, we find that when readers are matched with materials that are appropriate for their uh, reading ability, uh, learning improves. So it's pretty, pretty big, 30 million kids in the US get Lexile measures. And uh, we've measured over 100,000 books and a bunch of web pages and stuff. Uh, <clears throat> so just to give you an idea of, this, of the scale, uh, they range from below zero to over seven, 1,700 for like highly technical materials. So uh, the Lexile framework exists already. Why are we doing something else with it? Uh, and the reason for that is that previous Lexile research hasn't focused on these beginning reading, also called them BR materials. And for me, this is pretty much uh, reading materials appropriate for uh, K through two. There are some other people who are doing this sort of measurement and doing measurement in general, uh, but they are problematic for a couple reasons. One is they haven't considered these beginning reading books specifically, and the other is that they don't rely on empirical data, particularly student data. A lot of times it's just like uh, expert judgment uh, and grade level equivalents, which are uh, problematic for a variety of reasons. So the previous Lexile research is all empirically supported. Uh, but it has not uh, historically gone down specifically into this beginning reading area. So uh, <clears throat> our data set is 350 books appropriate for K through two. And uh, a couple of important things that we kept in mind in putting together our, uh, our book set. We wanted to make sure we had authentic texts with the pictures and formatting and everything in place because that's really important for beginning reading books. So for all of our studies, all the books were always presented with full formatting pictures and everything. The other thing is that we had this policy of turn no book away. Uh, you know, a lot of these beginning reading books have very strange properties. You know, maybe it'll be one sentence that spans over a bunch of different pages or just individual words uh, or, other, or other things that are problematic for um, text analysis. And so if, you know, if you're doing a study on text analysis, you might be like, well, I'm not gonna include that book. It's too weird. I know that's gonna be problematic in my modeling. So we wanted to have the exact opposite policy. We wanna say, no book is too weird to be a part of our study. So that was a, one of our guiding principles. So we want this research to be empirically based and we want to create an interval, not an ordinal scale. And that just means that the distance between you know, 100 and 200 on the scale is the same as 200 and 300. So it's not just an ordering, it's an actual continuous measure of difficulty or complexity on the book. We collected two classes of empirical measures, uh, student performance on an assessment task, which I'll tell you about, and then also human judgments of complexity. And one of the, this is not the main question, but one of the side questions of the project was, how much of a correspondence is there between what early reading educators believe is complex or difficult and what students uh, believe is complex and difficult through their performance? So uh, I really don't have time to do this full justice, but I wanted to tell you at least how we did our, uh, how we actually created these scale score values. Uh, so we used a psychometric modeling technique called the Roche model. There's a lot of different uh, modeling techniques. We use the Rush. Uh, I'd advise you to look on Wikipedia if you're interested in this. It's a really good introduction to it. But uh, the basic idea is you're gonna collect a bunch of empirical data. Could be answers to test questions. It could be survey data. You're gonna take all that empirical data, analyze it, and assign a single scale score to each text. So the first study uh, is the expert judgment study. We use all 350 of our books got 100 early reading educators, and we did this pair comparison approach where they look at two books on the screen at the same time, and they're asked this question. Which of these books 
presents more challenge for independent reading. They'd say this one, that one, this one, that one. Uh, did 12,000 comparisons in total. We're able to use the Roche model to analyze all that data and assign an interval scale score to each book in our study. Second study was on student comprehension. Uh, we actually did uh, a couple of things here, but I'll just tell you about one of them. Uh, so this is actually a lot more costly than doing the teacher survey. So we didn't do it on all 350 of our books. We did it on 90 passages excerpted from those books. We created a maze type assessment uh, with the authentic text. Again, the students are looking at the book with the pictures and everything in place, but there's a little, you know, every couple words, a word is removed and a multiple choice item is there. Like which word was in the text, uh, circle that word. 20 to 40 of those items per passage and we had 1,200 first and second grade readers uh, perform this assessment. We're able to analyze all that data using the Roche model and assign these interval scale scores to all of these texts. So then we can ask, how similar are the results between these two tasks? So on the x-axis here, we have the human judgment, uh, the ordinator, that was the name of the tool that we did our uh, pair comparisons with. So that Lexile measures on the x-axis, the maze Lexile measures on the y-axis for the same texts. And we see a correlation here of 0.79, uh, which is very good. This is, there's a high correspondence between what reading, early reading educators thought would be complex and uh, student performance on those tasks. This is a very good result. So that's kind of the first half of our work. We now have a set of texts that we have established uh, interval scale scores for each text. And now what we want to do is predict that scale score using only the text features. And this is what the Lexile framework does in general. We have a tool that analyzes a piece of text and predicts uh, what measure you would get if you went out and did an empirical study with it. But we want to do this now for these beginning reading books. Leave 20% out for validation and use 80% for uh, training and testing. So now I'll tell you a little bit about how we did our, uh, how we did our modeling. So we've talked about, we essentially have talked about the measurement piece of our project now, and now we're going to talk about the modeling. Uh, so there were a few guiding principles that we um, tried to keep in mind as we developed our text features. And the first is that beginning reading is different, and it's different for a couple of reasons. Different things are happening cognitively in beginning readers, and the purpose of reading is different. For example, uh, you know, early readers are trying to develop the skill of phonological awareness, an understanding of the connection between letter patterns and sounds when they're reading. We all do this same thing whenever we read, but we do it completely automatically. Kids have to learn how to do it. Uh, so that's one of the big differences. Uh, the other thing that is, and this is related, you know, the purpose is different. Sure, it's to you know, get information and read stories and stuff like that, but it's also to learn how the language works. What are the patterns? What are the rules? And so texts have different properties to support these different purposes. And we want to make sure that we address those properties when we develop our uh, measurement models. Another principle, and this kind of goes along uh, with what I was talking about earlier, is that we want to be sure we're modeling text at multiple linguistic levels. And these kind of go from the bottom up, from the sounds and words, trying to get at that, those questions of phonological awareness, uh, all the way through, you know, meaning in words, uh, sentence syntax, and then finally discourse features. And this is anything that moves beyond a single sentence. Pairs of sentences, paragraphs, an entire document. And for beginning reading, the discourse features that we're interested in mostly have to do with uh, repetition and patterning and that sort of thing. You know, if you wanted to model texts at a higher level, you could talk about discourse features, but they would be of a different character. So another thing that is sort of near and dear to my heart is that there are infinitely many ways of doing this modeling. You know, we have these couple of constructs that we want to measure. You can measure them in all sorts of ways, some very different, some little just tweaks. You know, well, what if I change this parameter to each of 10 different values? And we don't know which ones of those are going to be the best in terms of predicting our empirical measures. And the more of them that we can evaluate, the better our results are likely to be. So we created this framework of tunable and composable text feature extractors uh, to be able to develop a lot more ways uh, to evaluate the complexity of text than just a few, as, in, as is common in other studies. And Python is uh, great for this. You know, the introspection capabilities, the fact that uh, you know, functions are first-class objects, so you can attach things to them, pass them around, and see what information is in them. The other thing that uh, Python 
helps us here with is uh, the kind of batteries included notion, which I'm extending out to the Python ecosystem as well. There's all these amazing Python libraries, so we don't have to do all of this work ourselves. We can build on these available libraries. A lot of these will probably be familiar, with you, uh, familiar to you, and I'll talk about a few of them later. Some that might not be familiar uh, are these bottom two, uh, GenSim, which is a library for doing, their tagline I like is topic modeling for humans. And if uh, you may not be familiar with uh, distributional semantics models like uh, LSA or LSI, uh, latent semantic indexing and analysis. Uh, but these are popular in, in search and in uh, similarity and classification and all sorts of tasks. Um, so we don't have to do all of that work. Someone else has done that work and made a nice interface and we're able to use it. Another one uh, that it's not such a big deal, but it's nice that we didn't have to do it ourselves is this library for doing edit distance calculations, uh, which is also called the uh, Levenstein distance. And that's like fuzzy string matching, the number of single character replacements required to turn one string into the next string is the edit distance. So we use that for some of our features and we're able to use this uh, Python Levenstein library to do that for us. We didn't have to do it ourselves. So uh, I'd love to talk more about all the variables. We have limited time. Uh, so I can tell you that using these principles, we were able to develop, uh, we ended up with 242 uh, unique text features. These are all, or many of them are trying to measure the same constructs. You know, it's not like 200 constructs. Maybe it's like eight to 10 kind of constructs that we want to try to measure. And we have a lot of different ways to measure them. We did, uh, if, uh, we may have time at the end of the talk to look into this. I, uh, maybe not though. <laughs> we did, uh, we went, you know, we, 242 is way too many. So we wanted to reduce that down to a much more uh, manageable amount. So we actually used, um, uh, random forest uh, regression model for uh, variable selection, and we reduced this down from 242 down to a four variable model that uh, actually explained the most variance in our data set. So what are those variables? What are they? What are the four? Uh, so here they are. Uh, we gave them nice friendly names, uh, which you can read. The bottom two are uh, reasonably, you probably can get an idea of what those are. Uh, you know, books that have words with more syllables tend to be more difficult. Uh, we got uh, age of acquisition norms on 50,000 words from a study by uh, Victor Cooperman who used uh, Mechanical Turk. So that's kind of, you can get a sense of like, well, the age of acquisition of the words is higher. Those texts are probably more difficult, more complex. Uh, these top two may not be as obvious, so I'm going to show you some examples of uh, what those mean. So intersententral complexity. This is actually the edit distance variable. We also called it mean linear edit distance. Um, and it's the going sentence to sentence, what is the number of single character replacements required to turn sentence one and sentence two, sentence two and sentence three, et cetera. And what's the mean value of that? So this is highly correlated with length. Longer sentences are going to have higher edit distances, but it corrects for something that happens all the time in beginning reading books, which you'll see on the left side here, where the sentences are almost exactly the same with very little bits of information changed. So we want to capture that. This is kind of a discourse level variable. So uh, the one on the left here is uh, obviously very low. Uh, you know, it's the same. Uh, very few replacements are required for each string because there's so much shared between them. And the one on the right is novel text that's long, and that's a high measure. So this is one of most, uh, our most important variables. The next one is um, we called concept density. And I, I, can't, I don't have time to go into uh, the complete formulation of this one, but I can tell you that the basic idea of it is you create this vector space over your text, where each column is a word that was used in the text. And then you use some dimension reduction techniques to see like, how much can I compress this vector space and explain the same amount of information with fewer dimensions? And this is used uh, uh, you know, in, in those LSA and LDA type algorithms. It also has a relationship with uh, compression. Uh, and that's one we tested as well. We did um, you know, just test the length, use bzip, and test the length of the compressed string to the length of the original string. That has some problems, uh, so this ended up being a better approach. But they both try to get at the same thing. Uh, you know, so this one on the left, we got, we got biscuit, we got the cat. Uh, they're not doing a lot of different things. The same, word, the same words are appearing again and again uh, in sentences with each other. As opposed to on this other text, lots of novel words, really no pattern uh, sentence to sentence in terms of how those words are used. So the concept density is high. 
So did it work? I mean, were we able were we able to predict these uh, these empirical measures? And I mean, I guess I wouldn't be here if it didn't work. Uh, it did. Uh, here's the here's the model performance on the 20% holdout. So these were texts that we didn't do any, we didn't look at when we were developing our features. We didn't think about them at all. And we get a correlation of uh, 0.85. This is the predicted uh, Lexile measure from our model on the x-axis and the empirical measure on the y-axis. So this is very good. Correlation of 0.85. Uh, considering the, the error involved with this measurement, this is like a fantastic result. Uh, not a huge number of texts because it's only 20%, so I can also show you this is um, our, uh, this is actually our entire data set and using a leave one out cross-validation technique. So it's just another way to evaluate uh, the performance of the model. And we see, again, uh, a high correlation here, 0.87, with a predicted Lexile measure and the uh, empirical Lexile measure. So uh, that's basically the study. Uh, those are the variables that we did. Um, those are the results that we came up with. Uh, we're very pleased with them. And now I want to switch over into the, kind of the second part of the talk where we look at some of the IPython notebooks. So IPython notebook is like one of the coolest technologies that I've encountered in recent years. This is the project that I started using it on, and it's actually changed my workflow entirely. I find that I like do like three quarters of my coding in a web browser now, which is very surprising. So um, I'm going to go out of this presentation now and show you a couple of IPython notebooks. And uh, the first couple ones I want to show you are demonstrating some of the other tools that we used. Um, I'm going to talk about pandas and scikit-learn, and then we'll go into some of the other analyses. So pandas, if you haven't used it yet, this is another one that I started using on this project and has just made my life uh, a lot more convenient. Uh, so, I'll just kind of run through this really quickly. I've only scratched the surface of what Pandas can do, but even its very minimal capabilities are a huge help to me. Just in loading data, getting a quick sense of it, doing analyses. So I'm loading here a CSV that uh, has all of our stuff. I'm asking, here's my only, I only want my top variables. So it has this indexing capability. This DF is my data frame object. I'm going to index it and ask for my top variables. Is it? You want bigger? Is that better? Your left side is cut off. My left side. Move the browser to the right. Yeah? All right. There we go. Technical difficulties. OK. So it has some like nice convenience methods here. Uh, like describe. I just want to get some descriptive statistics on my variables. It has an understanding of that I've named columns. So this is like super convenient uh, for for data analysis. I can get a correlation between my metrics, and you'll see that there's there's like cross correlations between all of these variables, which is just how it is in reading. Like as you're moving up in complexity of books, everything kind of moves together. You know, they're not exactly correlated, but they are. They certainly are related. And then I'm going to just like do a quick scatter plot uh, with uh, empirical. This is an empirical Lexile on the left. So this is kind of like a data analysis exploration thing that I might do. Like, oh, I just want to get a sense of my variables. So pandas is really convenient for, for that sort of thing. And it has way more capabilities than I'm demonstrating, but I would encourage you to check it out. One of the other tools that we used uh, is uh, scikit-learn, which is this machine learning uh, software package in Python. It's another one of my favorite packages. It's got a lot, of, uh, a lot of nice properties. It's great documentation, great community, great mailing list. Uh, and one of the coolest things about it is that it has a unified interface for the various algorithms in it. So I'm going to show here uh, the unified interface for the regression algorithms. This is also there for classification and dimension reduction and, uh, and all sorts of things. So I'm going to read my data in here. I'm going to uh, load some of these, import some of these regression models. Then I'm going to do just a simple uh, cross-validation. I want to take out a random 20% subset. Then I'll loop over each of these uh, regression algorithm classes, instantiate it, fit it on training, evaluate it on testing. So the fit, dot fit is shared across all these, dot score is shared, and then dot predict is what you would use uh, to get its prediction. So uh, I can test here a couple lin different linear regression models, and then also a um, random forest uh, regression model, and we can see this is just printing out uh, correlations for each of these. So we can see that uh, the random forest regressor uh, 
does the best job. So actually, uh, I want to now jump into, oh, 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 I showed you my pictures too soon. Uh, I wanted to show you another notebook uh, that explains a little bit about how uh, random forests work. Um, and uh, this is something else I've found that the notebook is really nice for. If I'm, I'm curious about some new algorithm, I can kind of just uh, open up an IPython notebook, put in these markdown cells. You can input uh, markdown and raw text cells and LaTeX. Uh, and so as I'm going through something, I can just write up what I'm thinking about it. So uh, let me take you through this notebook. Um, I'll show you how uh, individual decision tree regression works and then how uh, random forest regression uh, works. So I've got a little, I've created this little plot function. You don't need to understand uh, what that does, but we're going to generate some plots with it. Um, so here I'm going to generate a series of plots and I'm using the fact that I can pass in one of these regression algorithms and it has the same shared interface. I'm going to pass in another regression algorithm in a second uh, and we can look at some of these plots. Okay, so what I'm trying to do here is this, can people see this? I want you to be able to see the whole picture. Okay. So uh, we have four variable model, which is hard to visualize. So we're just gonna look at two of our variables uh, and try and understand their relationship with complexity and how the random force is able to model that. Uh, so on the x-axis, we have concept density. On the y-axis, we have age of acquisition. And the color represents the empirical difficulty as established by our studies, and that's on the left here, moving from you know, negative 180 up to 500 lexiles. So I have allowed this tree to grow to a maximum depth of one. And how, what it's gonna do, if you say, I want this decision tree regressor to uh, predict empirical lexile measures, but it can only make one decision. What it's gonna do is split on concept density at about whatever that is, 0.73. And it's gonna say everything on the right is a little bit diff more difficult. I'm gonna take the average of all those values, that's about 180, and everything on the left is easier, and that's a down at about, I don't know, whatever that is, 75. So then, uh, no one would do a tree with just one node uh, or one split, so we can look at what this looks like. And if it's not clear, the, the color in the background, that's what the model is predicting for a point at that, uh, a book at, uh, at that point in the space. And all these dots actually represent books in our study. So uh, we do one more split. Each of those regions are divided again differently. We can do three, depth of three. We can see it's splitting, splitting, splitting. And then we can actually grow this out, essentially unpruned, out uh, to a depth of uh, 25. And so you can't use a single unpruned decision tree for regression because it'll overfit like crazy. Like that point in the top right there where it's green, I don't really believe that there's a magical region up there where it's green and everything around it is red. You know, this is, an, this is overfitting. So I want to show you, I'm going to jump from this single decision tree, grown deeply, which overfits, to a random forest regression model, which seeks to um, correct for this overfitting by training a bunch of different decision tree models, all on slightly different samples of the data. Each tree is trained on, you know, two thirds of the data, uh, and then you average over all these trees to get a prediction. So I've got my little another cell here. I'm passing into my contour plot function. Uh, now just a different uh, regression algorithm, the random forest regressor. I'm going to start with three trees, five trees, 100 trees, and then do these plots. So uh, same picture. This is just three trees. And you can see it's already smoothed out. It eliminated that green region up in the top. But it's still pretty choppy. We could probably do. We can probably do better. So here's five trees, smoothing out a bit more. And then here is a uh, 100 trees. And this is actually uh, smoothed. Uh, we're not getting so much of the overfitting. And what's nice is this can approximate any functional form. You know, this data is a little bit curvy. These variables are interacting with each other. I could try and correct for that manually, uh, you know, doing some log transform or something like that. But I've got four variables or potentially hundreds of variables. They may be act interacting in strange ways. I'd rather just have a model that's able to capture whatever functional forms uh, are present in my data. So that's random forest regression. Um, I have another notebook I can show you, but I wonder, I think I'm pretty close. And uh, one minute. Uh, well, let me show you this. Let me show you this one more and we'll, because uh, I, I did this last night, actually. Uh, I was playing around. 
Uh, but we've been looking at some uh, dimension reduction stuff, uh, like principal components analysis and factor analysis uh, and some others. And I was like, oh man, I wonder what would happen if I uh, did this dimension reduction or did this um, uh, transformations using principal components or factor analysis and then threw that into my random forest. Like, what would that do? So this is in my hotel room last night uh, playing with this. So it's really, the, this contour plot has changed a little bit. I've added a little rotator function here and um, I can pass in, it's gonna, it's gonna do this. Uh, the rotator will fit and then transform before it fits the model. So we can look at a couple of these. They, really, they just produced cool pictures, so. I don't know how meaningful this is, but it looks cool. This is PCA, so this is the exact same kind of analysis, but we just took our variables and uh, transform, transform them using principal components analysis before we do the fit. Then here's the same picture with factor analysis, which is, you know, produces, like it, it almost, it seems to have found that, uh, um, that linear relationship between these two variables. And then I wanna show you these two crazy ones. These are some nonlinear uh, ones. This is an ISO map uh, with a 10 variables, 20 variables. And then this is a, a method called locally linear embedding. This is, I'm not showing, this is not, I'm not, I'm not extracting meaning from this. This is to show you, like I had an idea in my hotel room last night. I was like, oh, I wonder if I could do this dimension reduction and see what it looked like. And it was like that uh, because of IPython notebook, because of scikit-learn and the shared interfaces between all the algorithms. So uh, let me go back to my, oh, I'm sorry. I did have one other thing to say. Um, one other thing about this that we did that I'd encourage you to consider doing uh, we, of course, stored all our notebooks in Mercurial, and uh, we set up our Jenkins server to whenever I would push to Mercurial, it would convert them to HTML and publish them to uh, a server locally. So whenever I do an analysis, I can immediately share it with all my colleagues. Uh, and I think this is a really powerful model going forward. So, okay, I'm over my time. That's it. Uh, I'm at Zondio. I work for Metametrics. We're hiring. We've got about four minutes for questions for Jeff. We've got a microphone over here. If you've got a question, we'd like you to please go stand at the mic so everybody can hear. Hi. Uh, that working? Okay. Thanks for the talk. That was really interesting. What I'm wondering is uh, the approach you described in the first part of your talk. Do you have you tried applying it to other languages than English? And do you think it would carry well over if you didn't? Uh, we have, we have. We have a Spanish framework, El Sistema, uh, and uh, I worked on that project, and it works really about the same way. And something that was fascinating um, in that project was we did, we did assessment items, uh, Spanish uh, language assessment items, but we also had a corpus of translated works, originally English, originally Spanish, translated, even a third language, and we found that there was an extremely high correspondence between our measures uh, between the translations, English and Spanish. Hey, Jeff. Um, so I've got two simple questions. Right. The, uh, and back to the features. How did you measure the syllable counts uh, in your words? Uh, the question is, how did we measure the, uh, the syllable counts? Uh, we actually used an available library.
Thank you.